This week on Life and Faith. His first confession, it's not to a policeman or policewoman. It's not to a a lover or a friend. It's to a priest. And of course, through him, it's a confession to God. One in four Australians are suffering from significant amounts of loneliness. Balance is important, though. It's best to take off the table this idea that religion is just going to be summarily dismissed from all things public. This is Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. Today, a tale of youth gone wrong, a religious cult, terrorism, murder, conspiracy, politics, intrigue, the search for forgiveness, and something we love at CPX, some redemption. Now, after the Abdullah's extraordinary story of forgiveness a few weeks back, you should check that episode out if you missed it. Today, the search for forgiveness through confession and repentance. And in Sydney, police maintained their tight security net around the Hilton Hotel, the scene of the bombing atrocity, even though all 12 heads of state were safely in Bowral. Meanwhile, two of the victims of the bombing are still in the intensive care ward at Sydney Hospital. At 12.40am on February 13, 1978, a bomb exploded at the front of the Hilton Hotel in Sydney. The bomb had been planted in a garbage bin, and as a truck attempted to empty the bin, it exploded killing two garbage collectors and a police officer guarding the entrance to the hotel lounge. Eleven others were injured, some very seriously. At the time, the Hilton was hosting the Commonwealth heads of government, including the Indian Prime Minister, Maraji Desai, and he was the target. Now, some background here. In July 1971, the founder of something called the Ananda Marga sect, which was an offshoot of Hinduism, Prabhat Ranjan Saka was arrested in India for the murder of six ex margis who'd left the group. By the 1970s, there were offshoots of Ananda Marga around the world that set up schools and charities and yoga centres. Saka's arrest sparked violence by supporters who thought that he'd been framed. Now, the Ananda Marga sect had gained a foothold in Australia, and some young people, often emerging from the fading hippie and anti-Vietnam War movement, were finding a spiritual home in mystical religion. One of those young people was Evan Pederick. Originally from suburban Perth, the son of a Methodist minister, but by 1978 a devoted member of the Ananda Marga sect. Ten years after the bombing, he turned up to a Brisbane police station to confess to the bombing and he spent nearly 10 years in jail for the crime. But even today, some people don't believe he was the bomber. Conspiracy theories abound, including the idea that ASIO planted the bomb to get more funding and commitment from the government to the anti-terrorism cause. There were trials, appeals, retrials, claims of false convictions, and the extraordinary situation of Pederick having to try to prove his guilt. Years after his release, Pederick became an Anglican priest. And the story is even more incredible than all that. And to help us untangle this today, we have Imre Salazinski. He is the author of The Hilton Bombing, Evan Pederick and the Ananda Marga. Imre has been a journalist and a writer. He's worked in politics and he was the editor of the Oxford Book of Australian Essays. Now, this story, it's an amazing, it's an extraordinary story. Mm. It's a sad one too, isn't it? Mm. What made it so compelling for you to the point that you wanted to write about it? Well, you're right. It is extraordinary. And I guess the sadness of it is something that has struck me more and more over time. Mm. I was driven to write it because the bombing of the Hilton Hotel in Sydney occurred while I was a cadet at, at the age in Melbourne. And I had a very tiny part, as I relate in the book, in in the coverage by the newspaper of the of the bombing, um, I spent a fair deal of the next ten years overseas. But when I came back to Australia, the bombing seemed to be just coming back into my life every time in a in a new version. Um, in the late eighties, finally we had arrests after ten years uh, of uh, the alleged bombers. And then we had long trials, and then we had conspiracy theories. And I felt over time that this was just a glaring and distressing open wound in the history of Australia in the late 70s. 
And when I finally got the chance to meet Evan Pedrick, the man who 10 years after the bombing did confess to it, was arrested for it, was convicted of it and jailed for it, I saw that the best way I could tell the story of the Hilton bombing and, as it were, reorder all of that was as a biography of this man that would tell the story of how he grew up, how he went so wrong as a result of being sucked into the jaws of a then violent religious cult and then set about trying to make good the terrible thing he'd done and to rehabilitate himself and to provide uh, such reparation as he could to the victims of this horrific crime. Now, for people who don't know, it's an extraordinary thing, but Hilton yeah. Hotel in the centre yeah. of Sydney, bomb goes off. What on earth was that about? What happened, just in quick summary? Uh, Damage, casualties. Yeah, okay, there was um, a bomb that went off outside the Hilton Hotel in Sydney when an, um, a garbage public garbage can was emptied by the Garbos uh, just before 1am on uh, Monday, the 13th of February, 1978. In the hotel at the time were a dozen visiting dignitaries from the Asia-Pacific region for Commonwealth Heads of Government Regional Meeting. Uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, as well as other Australian dignitaries, were also staying in the hotel. The bomb, as I say, exploded when the garbage can was thrown into the back of the garbage truck. It blew uh, two garbos, Ella Carter and Bill Favell, who were standing at the back of the truck at the time. It blew them to pieces. It also mortally injured a young policeman who was guarding the hotel on its front steps called Paul Burmistrew. He sustained a terrific head injury, which killed him nine days later. It caused about another uh, nine or ten injuries, some of them serious. It caused extensive damage up and down George Street in Sydney, where the Hilton was and still is, though the building has been since rebuilt. And for ten years, there was absolutely zero certainty about what had caused this atrocity. But in 1989, a man called Evan Pedrick, uh, then working as a public servant in uh, Brisbane, came forward, uh, confessed and explained exactly how he had uh, planted the bomb uh, as a uh, young and brainwashed member of a religious cult called Ananda Marga. Ananda Marga was a sub-Hindu cult in the 1970s. There were hundreds of vaguely Hindu religious cults around at the time. They'd become radicalised and, and violent in the early to mid-70s when their guru, P.R. Sarkar, was jailed in India. They committed acts of terrorism around the world, including in Australia in 1977, designed to put pressure on the Indian government to free him. Evan explained how he'd been, as a young 19, 20 year old, unknown Margie, they called themselves Margies, unknown Margie in the sense that a lot of them were being watched by the security agencies and the police. He wasn't. He told how as a result of that, he was the, the member of the cult recruited to uh, undertake the bombing. He, by that time, was a completely brainwashed initiate. His entire world, his entire universe, his entire perspective was Ananda Marga. He believed that the guru was going to take over the world soon, completely remake the world, and he and his fellow Margis would be at the peak of a new world order. He explained all this. He explained how the bomb was provided to him. He explained how he placed it in the garbage can outside the Hilton, and he explained how he attempted to detonate it the day before, on the late afternoon of Sunday the 12th of February, when he thought he saw the Indian Prime Minister, Maraji Desai, arriving at the Hilton for the conference that I just mentioned. So it was the fact that the Indian Prime Minister, Maraji Desai, the very man who had their guru jailed back in India, was here in Sydney, was what motivated the Ananda Marga to blow up the Hilton in an attempt to assassinate him. So Pedrick gets convicted, goes to jail. Pedrick gets convicted and goes um, to jail. He, he serves uh, close to 10 years. It's a relatively light sentence because he had come forward voluntarily and he had testified against his alleged accomplice. He comes out of jail in the late 90s, returns to Perth where he grew up as the son of a Methodist 
church minister and eventually becomes himself a minister in the Anglican church from which he's recently retired. And let's just put it on the record up front, Simon, at no point either before his initiation into Anandamaga nor at any point following his release from jail has he been anything but a, a model citizen and community member. You mentioned that Evan Pedrick grew up as the son of a Methodist minister. Yeah. He's uh, nothing particularly remarkable no. in his growing up, but he, he ends up sort of wandering around Tasmania. He gets into meditation mm. and so on. Now, you mentioned that you identify some characteristics mm. that make some people susceptible mm. to mm. cults, and you think there were some that particularly applied mm. to him. What were some of those? Uh, yeah, you're quite right. So in the early parts of the research for this book, I, I did a lot of reading about cults and I did a lot of reading about brainwashing because the period that's at the heart of the book, the 1970s, was also the great age for cults and for violence associated with some cults. I say some cults because cults aren't inherently violent, but there are clear flags that mark the way they can become so. And we can talk about how Ananda Marga became violent, if, if you like. So studies of cults and who fell into them, particularly in the 1970s, talk about exactly people like Evan. They tend to be young Western people from relatively prosperous middle class or lower middle class backgrounds, often with a, a family history that was a bit emotionally constrained or um, not a particularly nourishing emotional atmosphere. They've never really resolved their young adulthood and made a successful um, separation from their parents. The, the cult, one of the things the cult offers such a young person is a complete separation and a complete context and structure for a separation from the family of origin that so far has not been able to be successfully transitioned by the young person. And finally, Simon, very importantly, I think, for our conversation today, the most characteristic feature of these young people is that they see themselves as spiritual seekers and as unfulfilled spiritual seekers whose previous religious yeah. experiences uh, haven't provided whatever nourishment or, or sustenance or, or, or solace they, they are seeking. So for Evan, the transition into an Andamaga was very much begun through disaffection with the very, very kind of dry Christianity of that pre-uniting church kind of Methodism and then transitionary phases through harmless Indian spirituality exercises such as yoga and meditation, because yoga and meditation figure very prominently in Anandamaga, as they do in most of these Hindu sub-religions or, or new religious movements, there was an easy transition there. And it took a while mm. for Evan to realise that there was a lot more to Anandamaga than um, yoga and um, meditation. Yes, there was a lot more going on. There was a lot more going on. And, and let's be clear, that the, the main thing that was going on, that it, it took a while for those who initiated him to unpack for him, was that there was an all-powerful guru who was believed to have the qualities of a god. This is another thing that separates cults from things like transcendental meditation or yoga and things like this, and it's an, something that separates cults from mainstream religions as well. The Magis believed that Sarkar, whom they called Baba, they believed he had godlike qualities. He could um, He could speak every language on the earth, for example, he could uh, influence, directly influence events uh, occurring on the other side of the world. Evan, for example, when he failed to detonate the bomb that Sunday afternoon, believed that that was an intervention by Baba. Now, I just need to explain this bit. According to Evan Pederick, he attempted to set the bomb off at the appropriate time with a remote control device, but the bomb failed to explode. He was in the end relieved about this and he hitchhiked to Brisbane that night thinking the whole thing had been averted, only to hear the next morning that it had in fact exploded when the garbage collectors came to do their work. And of course that's very important because, let's face it, you'll do things for someone that you think is God that you won't do for most other people. Well, you say in your book that he didn't just drink the Kool-Aid, he sculled it and uh, certainly got to that point where he found himself in a position where he thought 
committing a really violent crime was the thing to do. And, you know, as much as you and I think your readers too, you kind of identify with him in yeah. some ways. You also say this was a reckless, stupid, murderous act. And it really it really was that. We can't sort of shy no, away from it. No, you can't shy away from it. And although I think my book has brought closure to the Hilton bombing, I know that's an enormous claim to make, but I'll I'll make it anyway. Yeah, let's, yeah, make, let's it. make it. <laughs> that's not the same thing as a happy ending. It doesn't bring back three young men, two of whom had young children at the time. It created two widows and Paul Burmistrew, the policeman, was, was engaged to be married. It destroyed the lives of three families. It, it caused tremendous injuries to to others. It was a, a horrendous thing to do. And you're right, uh, there are... Those are anyone my age who went through university in the seventies and was kind of associated in, in in the various subcultures can appreciate what Evan went through, can understand it, but there's absolutely no condoning it, and nor do I think for a moment that I I could have ever followed that path. Now Evan doesn't ask for, for he does ask for forgiveness, sorry, but he makes no excuses. He explains that he was an initiate in an all encompassing cult. But he doesn't claim that he he was insane. He's never attempted to avoid, I mean, since 1989, he's never attempted to avoid responsibility for what he did. What he has sought is to do his time, pay the price, seek forgiveness, and attempt to live the rest of his life in a positive and productive way, which, I mean, I regard him as a close friend, so I would say this, but I believe he's done exactly that. But that doesn't repair the damage. And, you know, the families of this crime are so traumatised that with, with one or two exceptions, they weren't willing to participate in my research at all. Life and Faith, and I'm speaking with Imre Salazinski, the author of The Hilton Bombing, Evan Pederick and the Anandamaga. From here we talk about Evan Pederick's quest for relief from the weight of guilt he carried with him for 10 years after the bombing. This is a crucial part of the story. Let's turn to a really important part of this book, which is that he eventually turns back not it's not a straight line, mm. it's not uh, easy, but he turns back towards the faith of his childhood. Yeah feeling that in this search for some degree of forgiveness, mm. um, which he recognized involved a serious amount of mm-hmm. repentance, and which for him meant turning up and confessing to the crime. This is a big part mm. of the story, isn't it? He feels compelled to do that. He get a degree of that sense, doesn't he? Sort of, he's freed from at least some of the weight of the guilt. Yes, exactly. You know, thinking about our conversation today, over the last uh, week or so, I, I was struck by how much th- this really is a book about versions of religion and also uh, the difference between a religion and a cult, uh, which is quite quite central to, to the book. You know, I suppose the, the book pivots around a particular moment. Um, the story in the book, I mean, pivots around a particular moment and, and, and Evan's life pivots around a particular moment. Um, the history of the, the Hilton bombing uh, and its place in Australian history pivots around this too. And it, his first confession on that evening in 1989, it's not to a policeman or policewoman. It's not to a, a lover or a friend. It's to a priest. It's to a Catholic priest. Um, and, of course, through him, it's a confession to God. Now, Evan had gone through confession in the years leading up to this moment by participation in an Anglican communion in Perth, but he had never felt that that confession had full meaning or was fully heard by God because he wasn't putting anything up against it. He wasn't putting any action up against it. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't doing anything about it. But at the moment that he sat down on that evening in 89 and confessed to God, knowing that the police would be arriving within an hour and he would then confess to them. Yes, he says he felt the guilt lift off him almost in a physical way, as though he'd been 
struck on the back by something. And during his period in jail, he continued to participate in Christianity through Catholicism, interestingly, but principally because that was the main available form of Christian communion while he was in prison. And um, once he was back in Perth in the late 90s, it was through the Anglican Church that his Christianity developed further and, and towards a ministry. But to go back to the beginning of his religious quest, you mentioned earlier that this Methodism in which he grew up, to him it was, to use your word, very dry, very formal, uh, almost businesslike. You know, the, the Methodist minister, including Evan's father, Don, would be dressed in a suit and tie, much like uh, the you know American TV evangelists uh, in their three-piece suits. And Evan felt that at some level this was not, the, the, to use a word I used a lot in the book because it was a word he used to me repeatedly, there wasn't really any juice there. It didn't engage the entire human being uh, physically, emotionally, in all of the ways that Ananda Marga did. Ananda Marga includes the physical disciplines of, of highly elaborate yoga practices, meditation, and through meditation, this sought-after state of complete bliss in which you're united with the guru who is your god. Of course, the reason that's a false path, or was at least for Evan, is that in that passage you lose yourself. You lose your previous identity completely. And Adamaga demanded a complete severing of all attachments if you wanted to progress through its stages. You cut off your family, you cut off your friends, you cut off your, your, your world picture, the one that you, you had coming in. And in losing his identity to a cult and going through all of the traditional stages of brainwashing, Evan completely lost his, his moral compass. And, and that was what mm. enabled him to commit murder. And, you know, I don't know if it's a religious theme or an existential theme, Simon, but, um, I've never really resolved it in my own mind. How can, I mean, Evan, he's my age, so he'll turn 66 in November. And for 63 of those 66 years, he's been a completely normal, law-abiding, decent, very gentle, uh, softly spoken individual. And for that three years, his identity was completely different. I mean, what do we do with that? How, how do we deal with that? How, how does... Uh, the legal system uh, deal with it. It's 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 still remains a puzzle to me. If, if you want to know the truth, how you can exit your own identity, have it if you like um, stolen from you, and then reclaim it. Now a lot of people don't ever reclaim it. Why this story I think is important, even outside an Australian context, is that it's not very common for someone to be brainwashed, enter a cult, commit a terrible act in as a result of that, but then completely come out the other side and see what they've done and be prepared to give an account of it. So there is a lot of scholarship on new religious movements, on cults and on brainwashing. But um, I like to think, you know, the, the evidence in this book will be helpful to those that uh, struggle to understand these things. There was something there that you mentioned in your book that I thought was very interesting, and that was you say that the Christianity that he adopt appears to set no limits to the terrible thing you might do and then the openness to you being welcomed back into the community, yeah. which is a lovely line. And I guess it's a big thing for a congregation to take on someone like Evan as their priest to having had that experience. It is an enormous thing. And um, I spoke to uh, Archbishop Carnley the um, West Australian uh, retired archbishop who ordained Evan. And uh, I asked Carnley what that felt like to him. And uh, he said he, he felt a, a moment of nervousness when um, he was required to, to ask whether there was anybody present who thought they could see a, a good reason uh, why Evan should not be ordained, but nobody did. <laughs> there could, yeah, could have been one exactly. or two with that But he thought. said that, he told me that what he felt most powerfully at that moment was that he was really living out the words of the Book of Common Prayer uh, where it talks about God desiring not the death of a sinner but that 
he may turn from his wickedness and live. So Carnley, and I think a lot of the other people that were involved in training even around the turn of the century, uh, really felt that this was a Christian journey not just for him but for them, uh, an, ex- an extremely vivid example of not excluding the sinner but um, accepting them if they confess and seek forgiveness. Mm. And society, of course, um, has taken that road with Evan too, but that's very difficult. Not everyone buys the jailbird conversion. Mm-hmm. What do you make of his? You're right. Not everybody buys the jailbird conversion. I, I make of his that it's, of course, uh, sincere, that he's been prepared in, in, in the late 1980s to make a full and detailed confession, first to God and then to society, of what he'd done. And then I think it's important that much later in in the second decade of, of this century, he was prepared to work with me and lay the whole thing out in the terms that we have. He didn't have to do that, but look, he was prepared to participate with me in a difficult seven-year exercise. That, but more importantly, the work that he has done in his communities, the various communities to which he's ministered in Perth, that to me um, is not a a cliché jailbird conversion. It's actually somebody who has uh, done a terrible thing and then sought to make good as far as possible for it. Uh, He described his years in prison as the desert experience, Mm. but he he thought God was always with Mm. him. So that was an interesting perspective. And through this, he felt, perhaps as he went on into his next chapter of life, he was uniquely able to share in the suffering of others. That's the true meaning of compassion, isn't it? To suffer alongside or with others. It's a hard one lesson for him. Yeah, though. it is a hard one lesson for him. And when I when I speak to him about it, he often quotes, uh, you know, St. Paul Uh, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. He he is aware that that his story is a rather graphic example of the Christian story of fallen redemption, but he's also at pains not to emphasise or claim any uniqueness for it. He he stresses the way that... It's not romanticising it. He's not romanticising it, and, and he'll point out that in the Christian worldview... We are, we are all continually falling, um, falling short, um, falling by the way, whatever. And we all require, if we're Christians, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but I'm very familiar with Christianity, uh, as Christians require, you know, forgiveness and redemption. I mean, you, you know, nor do you have to be a Christian to understand or um, to uh, associate or identify with, with that aspect of what it is to be human. Imre writes in his book about being exposed in a very particular way to human evil and malevolence, but also to the classical Christian sense of a descent into darkness, but also emergence into life, nourishment and light. I thought it might be nice to hear a passage from the conclusion to the book. Evan doesn't think about the events of 40 years ago compulsively, but neither does he avoid thinking about them. For three of his 63 years, he was an unrecognisable person. And that person did a terrible thing, with consequences beyond description. Evan agrees that his life, his desert experience, is an example of the Christian story, but resists any suggestion it is uniquely so. From a Christian perspective, that cycle of fall and renewal happens to each of us, constantly and throughout our lives in matters both profound and trivial. We break ourselves, and when we are finally made whole again, it doesn't mean the brokenness didn't happen. It is always there, like the marks of the nails on the hands and feet of the risen Christ. This has been Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart. 
Thanks so much today to Imre Salazinski. His book on this story is The Hilton Bombing, Evan Pedrick and the Ananda Marga. It's by Melbourne University Press and it's available now. Next week. It's almost as if it's creating its own little enclave of like, you know, you can work, rest and play here. And this is the type of lifestyle you have to live in order to sustain this life of being in the middle of the city. But the apartments are 22 floors above the actual retail bit. And so it's this strange dynamic of let's enjoy the best bits of the city, but let's not engage with the reality of it.